Yeah. <laughs> wow. There we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to our artist talk in our tiny little presentation room. <laughs> Uh, it's probably uh, one of the bigger crowds we've had. I think I've had 30 people in here before. I think today maybe we're doing about 34 people. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I welcome those of you who have never been to Lightbox before. Uh, it's nice to see you, and I'm glad you got to come to the gallery. We're going to enjoy a beautiful opening tonight with Austin's gorgeous photography. I'm really excited about Austin's show and the fact that Austin's fairly well known for his photography in the Northwest, and he spreads it out a lot. Uh, but I don't remember <laughs> seeing many prints over the years. And of course, we're all about prints at the gallery. So uh, I think a year or two ago, we might have had a little talk and it might have planted a seed. And now we have a beautiful show of yeah. some 60 of the most gorgeous Palladium prints I've seen. I spent a nice morning with my coffee yesterday morning with them. And I got to give my compliments to the gentleman who printed the work for Austin. And that's Paul Cunningham. Paul, mm -hmm. where are you? I'm a big fan of platinum printing and uh, for the beautiful tonal range and just knowing the archival quality of those prints uh, makes them stand above all. So I got to congratulate you guys for all the hard work it took to do this. All right? <laughs> Thanks, <Michael. laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, I have nothing more to say. I want to thank you again for coming. I'm turning it over to this fantastic photographer, Austin Granger. No relation, obviously. I don't have, <laughs> yeah. I have near, no, not, not uh, nearly nepotism the talent here. of this <laughs> No nepotism going on. Thank you, Michael. Sure. And Thank you. Project. Project. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Thank you. When I signed up for this gig, it seemed so safely far away months ago. <laughs> but, um, Thank you for all for coming. Um, I was going to read a little bit, and then we'll have plenty of time to uh, talk. And I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions afterwards. And then we can look around at the prints. Um, so the last time I gave a talk like this at the Portland Art Museum, I was so nervous that partway through, my hands went numb from lack of breathing. <laughs> I remember hearing my voice as if from some great distance, and at the same time thinking, I'm going to faint. I'm going to faint. <laughs> Fortunately, I made it through, but barely. I'm telling you this to keep you on the edge of your seat, wondering if at any moment I might keel over. <laughs> it's true. Uh, first, I'd like to offer a few thanks. I want to thank a fellow photographer, platinum printer, and friend, Paul Cunningham of the Cunningham Press, without whom this show would not exist. Some time ago, Paul approached me with the idea of rendering a few of my point raised pictures in platinum palladium. Long intrigued by this old and honored process, I gave him some files and some guide prints and Paul went to work. The resultant prints were deep, warm, luminous, and alive. So we made a few more, and then a few more, and a partnership developed. We grew more ambitious. I can't recall exactly whose idea it was to attempt a show of this size, but I can tell you that Paul has the endurance and the patience of a saint. I wish you could have seen some of our meetings with us studying prints together, me sitting there in silence with some strange expression on my face, and Paul finally saying, OK, tell me what you're thinking. And then me following with something like, it's beautiful, don't get me wrong, but can we give the mid-tones just a smidge more bite and maybe raise the highlights a tad, just a click? Like, if we had tw something with 20 clicks, can we get the highlights just a half a click hotter, but without touching the shadows, just <laughs> a hair. Just a hair. I tell you, the patience of a saint. Um, I feel like we climbed a mountain together, Paul. Thank you, Paul Cunningham. Uh, I'd like to mention my father, who kindly let me take his picture, even though he hates having his picture taken. And my mother, who diligently helped me whittle down well over 100 picture contenders to the final 60. She's not here tonight because she wants to come when no one is around, so she can properly study each picture in the way that truly only a mother would. <laughs> um, thanks also to my wife, Gina, who, like Paul, possesses a saint-like patience. She is always supportive of my endeavors, even when they turn me into a raving, raving insomniac. And thanks to our children, Myers, Hope, and Finn, who are quick with good advice on this show, such as, Dad, you can't show pictures of dead animals. Nobody wants to see pictures of dead animals. <laughs> they may have a point. I'll have you know there is only one dead animal in this show, if you don't count the graves. 
<laughs> They're very understanding, though. They're very understanding, though, my family, very tolerant of my eccentricities, hardly complaining when we have to stop at this or that so that dad can haul out his camera again. Well, except for that time at Disney World. <laughs> Those of you who've been to Disney World know that they have the most amazing, most horrifically gigantic parking lots. They stretch all the way to the horizon. It was on our first day going to the park, and we're driving in through one of these vast parking lots, and the sun was shining, and the light was glorious on this vast plain, empty except for there, right in the middle, all by itself, a lone, abandoned wheelchair. It was fantastic. There's a picture, I shouted, but for some reason, reason they didn't want to stop. <laughs> it, still, it still haunts me all these years later. I've, <laughs> it's true. I've included this story. I've included this story because I think it says something about me, although I'm not sure what. Uh, more thanks. A sincere thank you to the captains of the Lightbox Photographic Gallery, Michael and Chelsea Granger. Though as far as we can tell, we are not in fact related, Michael and Chelsea have, from the beginning, treated me like family, allowing me to come into this space they created and express myself while being supremely supportive all along the way. I have a confession to make. The first time I ever visited Lightbox, years ago, I didn't introduce myself. I just sort of snuck in, looked around, and slunk off. <laughs> if you'd had seen me then, you'd have never suspected that in my mind, I was already plotting a takeover. <laughs> Before this gallery existed, I lived here in Astoria for two years. I'd spent countless hours roaming these streets, and so it felt like I was fated to hang my pictures here. More than that, though, I knew right away I wanted to have a show at Lightbox because I loved this gallery. I loved its unaffected simplicity. Open and high, and yet intimate at once, Lightbox reminds me of a little country church. It's a place, I think, that puts a person in the right state of mind to look at pictures, and I feel very fortunate that it exists. Thank you again, Michael and Chelsea, for having me. Um, finally, I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Michael and Chelsea, uh, <laughs> that they're not here. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank you. I know that some of you have come from far away. Many of you have come from far away. I think it goes without saying that this show is important to me, but it wouldn't mean much without you here to see it. As I've written, photography for me is in part a way to forge a connection so that we aren't strangers anymore, but friends. Thank you, my friends, for coming. When I first sat down to write this talk, I wrote on the cover of my notebook the words simple, sincere, and honest. I thought I could use a reminder, a kind of tether to try and keep me grounded. Sometimes with these things, I have the tendency of getting too abstract or choosing what sounds good over clarity, or else I convince myself that I know what I'm doing more than I do. The truth of it, if I'm honest, is that in trying to explain my photography, I often find that my words fall short. No doubt this is because my understanding falls short. When I'm out making pictures, I am sure of what to do, but the why of it, that's the hard part. Often, I think I understand, only to find later that my position has changed. Sometimes I contradict myself. Sometimes I feel like the real answer is forever out of reach, that I'm like a dog chasing its tail. Often these days, I feel like the camera leads me. Thinking about the why of it just ties me in knots. How can I pretend to explain it? I can tell you that photography dominates my life. When I am not photographing, I'm working on photographs. And when I'm not working on photographs, I'm thinking about photographing. Photography has become a kind of spiritual practice for me, by which I mean that it is not simply a parallel track running alongside my life, but one that is intertwined with it. Photography shapes my life. It gives me purpose. It is my North Star. Of course, it wasn't always like that. I joined the Navy when I was just 18, not long after high school. Before I left, my grandmother gave me a little Olympus point-and-shoot to take with me on my travels. And in the course of four years spent living on an aircraft carrier, there would be a lot of traveling. The first overseas port we visited was Alangapo City in the Philippines. Alangapo was also, I discovered in preparing for this talk, where I exposed my first ever role of black and white film, Tri-X, I think. 
With that roll, I photographed chaotic, rain-washed McSaysay Drive, all madly decorated jeepneys and billboards for San Miguel beer. I photographed dive bars called Hollywood and Big Joe, and also my drunken shipmates and flame eaters and bar girls. Looking back now, I think I chose black and white because somehow I knew that a straight representation wouldn't touch how I'd come to feel about the experience. It was an experience that needed to be set apart, to be mythologized. Either that or I just thought it would look cool. <laughs> well, I wouldn't give back my Navy days for anything. By the time my stint was up, I wanted to do something different. So I did the most different thing I could think of, which was to go to UC Santa Cruz and study philosophy. <laughs> I live by the beach. From my porch, I could hear the amusement park, the boardwalk, the old wooden roller coaster. It was an idyllic time, though not without its hazards. For people like myself, already prone to living in their heads, adopting thinking as a full-time profession can leave one feeling a little bit detached, like a deep-sea diver who has forgotten to come up for air, or a ghost still hanging around in the world, but barely. As an antidote to this mental removal, I started going on long walks and bringing my camera along with me. I must have felt it would become important, and it did. Carrying a camera was reason to start looking at things, really looking. A piece of driftwood, a length of kelp, a bird skull. It didn't really matter. Bringing my attention round to bear on things quieted my mind, and it felt good and right. It felt like I'd found a bridge back to the world. It felt like a reunion. I'm sure I wouldn't have thought of it like this at the time, but looking back, I think I discovered that photography could be a kind of meditation. After graduation, I moved back to the San Francisco Bay Area, where I'd grown up. I wrote a terrible novel. It was never published, thankfully, though I'll confess it wasn't for a lack of trying. In any case, soon enough, the money ran out. I couldn't find a job as a philosopher, so I had to humble myself. I went to work at a photo lab called Arts 2000 Photo, which even in 1997 sounded a little dated. <laughs> Arts was located on the outskirts of a mall parking lot next to the freeway. People would drive up and drop off their rolls of film so we could develop them and make prints, double prints, for a few extra bucks. We sifted through people's lives like we were minor deities. Besides that, though, I liked it because it kept me connected to photography. It kept me thinking about photography all day long. And I was photographing more and more. My favorite place to roam was Point Reyes National Seashore. I'll lose my voice, Paul, if I shout too much. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> already. I don't, I'm not used to talking. I don't talk this much in a whole week normally. Uh, my, my favorite place to roam was Point Reyes National Seashore, the triangular-shaped peninsula just north of San Francisco. Jutting way out into the ocean, Point Reyes is the edge of the edge of the continent. It's attached to the mainland, but barely. Beneath Tomales Bay, which forms most of Point Reyes' eastern boundary, lies the San Andreas Fault. In the Great Earthquake of 1906, it wasn't San Francisco, but Point Reyes that experienced the greatest geologic displacement. And the peninsula is still moving. Like some colossal ship, it steams northward at the stately pace of two inches per year. Point Reyes is a place apart, and it feels it. It is widely believed that Point Reyes is the Plymouth Rock of the West, the place where Sir Francis Drake and his galleon, the Golden Hind, first landed. Drake's crew found the land to be grim and inhospitable. In his journal, the ship's chaplain, Francis Fletcher, wrote, How unhandsome and deformed appeared the face of the earth itself, showing trees without leaves and the ground without greens. On the weather, Fletcher frequently complained of the nipping cold and the thick mists and the stinking fogs. Point Reyes is a solemn land. The coastal Miwok people who once lived there considered Point Reyes to be the abode of the dead. That seems about right to me. There is a feeling that overcomes those who wander there, as I did on countless days, that the peninsula stands somehow outside of everyday experience. It is otherworldly, that place, or rather, it seems neither here nor there, but someplace in between. It is a difficult thing to define. I know only that nowhere else on earth have I so strongly sensed the imminence of the spirit, and I am not the only one. Study a map of Point Reyes and the names of its features. Read as if from fiction, from myth, as if from some ancient allegory, Point Resistance, Mount Vision, Secret Beach. There is a tangible air of mystery that permeates Point Reyes as surely as its summer fogs. 
I often find <clears throat> that in attempting a description of the peninsula, ordinary adjectives fall short. <clears throat> And so I've come to say that Point Reyes is a terrible place. It is terrible in the awesome, forbidding, haunting, lonely, fearsome, and yes, beautiful way of the word terrible. Terrible with a capital T. Terrible, I imagine, in the Old Testament sense. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an archaeologist. I had a book called The World's Last Mysteries that I enjoyed poring over. It described in great detail and with many interesting pictures and illustrations fabled lands like Easter Island and El Dorado and Stonehenge. Point Reyes seemed a place like that, a place with secrets to be discovered. I went there every chance I could. My camera was my passport and my purpose. I would go to this place to search for treasures. And I found them too. And in the process, I found something of myself as well. Point Reyes was teaching me how to photograph. Years passed. I bought a kayak to better explore the peninsula's many bays. I had adventures. I was attacked by elephant seals. I was attacked by birds. I befriended sea lions. I got lost more times than I can count. I developed a relationship with the land. It became a part of my life, a part of my life's story. It comforted me, too. I went there after 9-11. I went there after my wife and I lost our first child just before he was born. Point Reyes gave me solace. In time, I decided that I wanted to write a book about it. I wanted to make an ode to this place that meant so much to me. It took a long time. I wanted to get it right. When it was done, I sent it out to some publishers and awaited their response. The responses were positive, beautiful, wonderful, captivating, e even a future classic. <laughs> Unfortunately, they couldn't publish it. They were more of a prose publisher, and there were so many pictures. They were more of a photo book publisher, and there were so many words. <laughs> they didn't have the money. The Sierra Club told me they just shut down their publishing house. They told me my timing was bad. <laughs> There's no getting around it. It was a tough defeat. I thought that maybe, maybe, if I persisted long enough, it would eventually get published, but the rejections were so hard. I put a lot of myself into the book, and so I took it personally. I didn't have the strength for that, not again. So I put the book on my website, the whole thing, and I walked away. Life went on. I continued to photograph. My camera led me down innumerable roads. I moved to Oregon. My wife and I had three more children. More years passed. And then, not so long ago, in fact, I received a phone call. It was the very last publisher I'd sent the Point Reyes book to. I'd never heard back from them, and I'd forgotten all about it. They told me they were in the process of moving and were going through things, and they'd found a box, a box with my manuscript in it. They said they liked it very much and that they wanted to publish it, and they did. <laughs> if it was fate, then fate has a funny sense of humor. But it was all for the best, I think. For after my surrender, I threw myself into my photography even more intensely than before. I redoubled my efforts without thought of a goal, at least not a professional one. I photographed more than ever for myself, and slowly, without my even realizing it, my pictures began to change. My interests began to broaden. I started seeing pictures everywhere. I made a list for you. It's called, Things I Like to Photograph. <laughs> Shipwrecks, crows, corn mazes, ditches and holes, doors and windows, newspapers and bins, dead trees, empty chairs, locks and chains, hardware stores, shoe repair shops, key shops, pawn shops, pornography shops, telephone booths, petroglyphs, graffiti, hand-painted signs, incomplete signs, incorrect signs, unintelligible signs, yard sales, tree houses, dead ends, truncated overpasses, corner stores, windmills, flags, fences, walls, break areas, strange shrubbery, cigarette machines, shrines, memorials, trophies, missing persons posters, missing pet posters, peeling wallpaper, flotsam and jetsam, butt shelters, ticket booths, old cars, covered cars, covered buildings, scoreboards, billboards, empty stores, empty fields, street lamps and lanterns, statues, ruins, psychic shops, bowling alleys, bumper stickers, confined animals, solitary cars, things out of place, things that have been fixed, things that have been protected, things that are endangered, things that are obsolete, estrangement, confinement, decay, work, time, violence, freedom, flight, isolation, desolation, connection, religion, death, etc. It's an ambitious list, I know, even... <laughs> 
a little ridiculous, especially toward the end. Can one photograph ideas? What I'm trying to get across, though, is that as my photography evolved, it began to seem like subjects were almost beside the point, or that everything was in play, that the real subject was life. This change in my way of thinking about photography was gradual and not really a conscious one. It was more like I was riding an invisible current. I wasn't aware of it until I stopped to look around and realized I was in a different place. At the time, I was just exploring, just walking and looking and photographing. I started photographing what I think of now as evidence, evidence of something having happened or perhaps something about to happen. I began to make pictures that were about what wasn't shown, leaving things out in the hope, I think, of letting you, the viewer, in. I began to look for pictures that felt like stage sets or illustrations from a book, a book that the viewer would help write. I started to make psychological pictures, pictures of people without people in the pictures. Somewhere along the way, I started to think I might be able to express myself using external objects. I began to think that a subject really could carry the weight of an emotion or idea, even if that subject on the surface was not explicitly related to that emotion or idea. This is what I mean by correspondence. These are tricky questions, but some of the most vital for me as a photographer. Can external objects re correspond to internal conditions? Can photography be expressive, wildly expressive, without being self-absorbed or pretentious? Can I bridge the gap? Can I meet a stranger in the middle and connect, truly connect? This is also what I mean by correspondence. I mean communication a wordless exchange. Can I make you feel what I feel? Or better, can I express what you feel? Can we dissolve the barrier? I've thought about this a lot, and my answer is sometimes. I have some strategies. Sometimes people ask me why I photograph in black and white, and I'm always a little taken aback by that question. It surprises me. I do photograph in black and white, don't I? <laughs> I don't even think of it like that anymore. <clears throat> They're just pictures. But don't you see in color? And I say, I do, but I feel in black and white. But that's not quite right. What I mean is, as I make my way around in the world, color is not my primary impression. My primary impression of the world is a series of thoughts and feelings. And anyway, is that really the purpose of photography? to try and construct a faithful double of reality, a two-dimensional chemical echo? That's not how I think of it. For me, the subject of a picture is often not the subject pictured. I don't look at photographs as if I were looking through a window. I look at photographs as photographs. Sometimes I think the ostensible subjects in my pictures have about as much to do with the real subjects as a toaster has to do with a porcupine. I believe that black and white photography has certain strengths. What are we doing when we photograph in monochrome? What are we trying to show? Form, pattern, the play of darkness and light, but what else? I think when we photograph in black and white, we're telegraphing something to the viewer. We're telling them that though our pictures obviously have a relationship with the subjects depicted, they are not solely about those subjects. For by using black and white, which is clearly an abstraction from reality, we're telling the viewer that what we're trying to convey is not simply an objective representation of the subject, but something else, something in between the subject, the viewer, and us. With black and white, our viewers are, I think, more apt to take a leap with us, a leap into the realm of feelings and ideas, and that's exactly where I want them. I've photographed a lot of empty fields. They have a certain pull for me. I feel peace in these spaces. For a long time, though, I was frustrated with my attempts to photograph them. The pictures never felt right. I tried a lot of different things. I'd fill the frame with the ground, with the sky just a sliver. Or the opposite, a thin strip of horizon under a big blank sky. Nothing worked. But then, one day, I was standing in the middle of one of these fields, fuming that I could be defeated by something so simple, when suddenly a thought occurred to me. I'm not trying to photograph the empty field. I'm trying to photograph what it feels like to stand in an empty field. 
It seems now like an obvious thing, but at the time it was a revelation and one that made all the difference in the world. I leveled the camera and made the picture. By making my technique more transparent, I got myself out of the way and the feeling shone through. I do this a lot now. I practice a deadpan style. This may sound strange, but I'm trying to be as artless as possible. Sometimes I think the more you show of yourself as a photographer, the more your viewer is likely to see you and not what you're trying to get across. I mean to say, if you fill your pictures up with your own mannerisms, you don't leave any room for the viewer. You don't let them make the picture their own. I want to make quiet pictures, pictures with a stillness, pictures with space enough that you might enter into them and there see your own mind at work. I want to make pictures that let you breathe. A good photographer, I think, like a good magician, doesn't want you to think of tricks. A good photographer makes you think that the picture you're looking at couldn't have been any other way. Of course there are techniques, there are strategies. I've come to think of composition as not only visual, but emotional as well. Compositions can make one feel. Say you find an old truck in an empty parking lot. Fill the frame and what do you get? A picture of a truck. But step back 50 feet, 100 feet, how different it feels. And what's the picture of now? Is it still a truck? Maybe the truck is you, or I, or anybody. A little boat on a big, dark sea. Another strategy I use is that of juxtaposition. There's a picture downstairs of a man working away in an office. A meter on the sidewalk keeps time. There's a ladder leaning against the building leading to the roof. Maybe it represents his professional ambitions. Maybe it's his escape route. Now, are these things really related? Through the power of composition, they are now. One of the great wonders of photography is that one can make two plus two equal five. Sometimes I use juxtaposition over multiple images. I put pictures together, bounce them off each other to give them new meanings. I found a dead coyote in the middle of a road once. It made me sad and so I photographed it. Truth be told, sadness aside, I liked the way the dashed center line ended at its head, forming the shape of the number four, a shape echoed in the coyote's bent front limbs. On another day, I photographed from afar a homeless man sleeping in a field. I didn't have a thought of the coyote, at least not consciously, but when I took, put those two pictures together, I saw that the man and the coyote were laying in almost exactly the same way, and it struck me that together, the pictures became about estrangement. The coyote, forced to navigate our highways and our barbed wire fences, is estranged from its ancestors' original paradise. The homeless man, ironically returned now to nature, is estranged from his society. Both have been struck down by forces beyond their control. Sometimes in my pictures I like to hide things, or else leave things vague enough that you don't quite know what they are. My theory is that the more I hide, the more likely you'll be coaxed into participating in the making of the photo, and then the photo will become more personal to you. We'll meet halfway. Take this, this picture, that, where, this picture, for example. What is it? A window of some kind, obviously, but what's behind it? It seems to be an enclosure, but are you inside, wanting to get out, or outside, wanting to get in, or are you just waiting for something to appear? What would that be? I'll tell you a secret. Behind that window is nothing. It's just a picture. Put more positively, behind that window is you. Your mind, your mind is behind that window. I'm often drawn to subjects like this, subjects which lack distinguishing characteristics. I like the vague and generic. My idea is that the emptier a subject is, the more likely you'll see it as an idea, as a symbol. A few years ago, I made a picture of a white door the only thing remarkable about this particular door was that it had absolutely nothing remarkable about it. It was so nondescript, in fact, so perfectly plain, that it became almost a platonic ideal of a door. It was just door, or passage. And passage is universal. It means something to you. See, I want you to see what's in your own mind. I want to make mirrors. They're all pictures of your head. They're all Rorschach tests, every last one. 
The writer Goethe once said, a man sees in the world what he carries in his heart. It's the same with photographs. We bring all of ourselves to our looking at them. Take that picture of the elephant there. I've never really thought of it as a picture of an elephant, even at the time I took it. For me, it's a picture of confinement, of isolation. It reminds me of something Hieronymus Bosch or Francisco de Goya would have painted, some kind of nightmare, an animal personification of some human turmoil. A lot of people, though, maybe most people see an elephant, and that's OK. There's not a wrong answer. Trying to operate like this doesn't always work. If there's one thing I've learned from sharing my stuff with people, it's that people often see the, ver the same picture very differently. There are different sorts of people in the world. I certainly don't mean this to be a value judgment. There is no high or low here. But I think it's fair to say that some people are more literal-minded than others. Their relationship to the world is like that of two interlocked gears. They are grounded. And a picture of a tree is a picture of a tree. With other people, things are a bit more slippery. Things can be other things. The gears spin more freely. I bring this up because, depending on the viewer, sometimes pictures just don't translate the way I intend them to. One time I took a picture of a dead cow on the road, on the side of the road outside of Winnemucca, Nevada. I thought it was a pretty good picture. I liked the cruel midday desert light, the road receding into the distance, the bloated black cow. To me, it felt like a serious picture, brutal but clear and strong, and not really about the cow. The cow was me, it was you, it was everyone. This was a picture about death, not just the cow's death, but death. I thought it was a good picture. And later, when I got home, I worked on it for a long time. I worked hard to get it right. I readied it to share with people on the computer. Man, I thought, this is going to make them weep. And then I sent it out into the world. Shortly, my computer dinged at me, letting me know someone had seen it and had commented. It was a girl I knew from high school, Karen. She wrote, Boy, you wouldn't want to poke that thing with a stick. Smiley face, smiley face, smiley face. <laughs> what can you do? I, I, follow, I follow an inner compass. I figure the best I can aim for is to photograph the things that make me feel in as clear a way as I can and hope that then you will feel them too. I don't really know what it is I'm looking for when I'm out photographing, but I know it when I see it. When I'm photographing well, I have the uncanny sense that the photographs were already there, just waiting for me. They feel predestined. I quiet myself and they appear. Photography for me is passive like that. I put up my antennae and wait. I recognize pictures right away. I recognize how they feel. When it's going well, when it's going well, it's easy. And I don't have any doubt about either the subject or how it should look. I recognize my pictures. I know them. They're like the pieces of a puzzle. I may not know quite what the puzzle is of, but I know which pieces belong to it. Good pictures feel charged. They feel significant. They have a certain ache. Sometimes I feel like I'm collecting archetypes or hieroglyphs from a language I don't quite yet understand, but which promises to become clear over time. The thing that nags at me, though, the question that comes in the middle of the night is this. Am I collecting or am I projecting? I'm not so sure. Maybe all those pictures that seem predestined, just out there waiting for me, those pictures that seem to speak my name, that feel like clues, maybe they're all just the ephemeral projections of my own psyche. Maybe all this is just me turned inside out. Maybe I could roam the whole world. Searching and searching, but in the end, all I'd find are my own desires and fears, my own brain alone in a hall of mirrors. Maybe I'm trapped. Am I deciphering the map, or am I the map maker? Am I solving the puzzle or creating the puzzle? Does one pray because God is up there, or is God up there because one prays? Why do we photograph? Are we recording our story, or are we writing our story? Simply... Sincerely, honestly, I don't know. When I'm traveling with my children and they ask me if we're there yet, I always say, kids, the journey is the destination. <laughs> they hate that. <laughs> but I think it does contain some truth. 
maybe in the grand scheme of things, in both photography and life, there's really nowhere to get to. Maybe the questions are part of the answer. Maybe the meaning's in the doing after all. And maybe that's OK. Downstairs, there's a picture of an empty billboard out on Highway 61 in Mississippi. Next to it is a telephone pole cross covered in kudzu that looks like praying hands. The spot is near the legendary crossroads where it's said that the bluesman Robert Johnson sold his soul to the, sold his soul to the devil in return for mastering his guitar. I've always thought that story was a metaphor. If you give yourself completely to something, if you let it take you over, you will gain powers at a price. I'm no master, but I've put a lot into my photography. As I said, it dominates my life. It defines me. It's what I do. It's what I've devoted myself to. I'd like to think I'm getting better, that I'm ripening. I'm doing the best I can. Sometimes people find my pictures sad or lonely, and I can't deny there's some truth to that. If you couldn't tell already, I am familiar with what Churchill called the black dog of depression. Photographing keeps me just ahead of the hellhounds. But though my pictures may look sad, I am seldom happier than when I am making them. Sometimes I hit dead ends, but I also find what feel like signposts, like beacons, and I've been witness to some extraordinary things the most wonderful things. There's a certain kind of storm light common enough around here when the rain clouds form a black curtain behind while the low sun illuminates the foreground like its center stage. It's my favorite kind of light. It's light that can make a garbage can seem holy exactly as it is. In this light, all my questions are burned away and I feel then the most perfect joy, thankful that I am in the world doing exactly what I was meant to be doing. It feels like some kind of grace. Thank you. I'd be happy to take a few questions, but first, and I had to write this down, if you'll allow me, I wanted to put in a couple of quick plugs. Um, I hate to do the plugs, but um, there are some sign, I would, no, anyway, there are some signed copies of the Point Reyes book downstairs. Um, Elegy from the Edge of a Continent, Photographing Point Reyes, contains 83 photographs, as well as a collection of wide-ranging essays on the peninsula and just about everything else. They're $30. Uh, we also have some catalogs, which contain reproductions of all the show's 60 pictures. Um, we're asking $25 for those. And then, of course, there are the platinum, palladium prints themselves. Um, there's some priceless floating around. They are for sale. Um, they're not inexpensive, I have to confess, but they are rated um, to last over a thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> so I was thinking on the way here, I was thinking if you spread that o out over um, <laughs> over 12,000 months, it's, it's not so bad. Um, finally, if you think this show, if you think this show is worthy. Um, Please take some pictures and share them and your thoughts on Facebook or so whatever social media when you get home. Um, tell your friends about it. Um, this show is only going to be up for four weeks. And the more people come, the better chance we have of selling a couple of prints. And uh, I am, believe me, I am not expecting to make money off this thing. But um, <laughs> if I could just get slightly more out of the hole, I would be, <laughs> and my wife would be uh, ecstatic. So. Um, yeah, that's all I have. I want to thank you again. I really appreciate you coming here. If you couldn't tell, uh, I'm very nervous. But I, if, if, I, if you take away anything, I want you to take away that I'm really grateful that you all drove out here and um, came out to see this show. I really appreciate it uh, a lot. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> That was tough. The, the, <laughs> was it tough? Were you afraid I was going to faint? I, don't know. I was getting a little. You know, actually, the dog helped me a lot. Oh. And this one moment, I just looked up and I looked at the dog's face, and I felt like 100% better. All of a sudden. <laughs> I was anyway, like, that's my audience right here, this dog. I want to invite everybody to stick around. We have a big old gallery to spread out into, and it's nice and cool outside there. And, and uh, we'll slowly be putting out some nice food and everything for everybody. So give us a little time. But, uh, anyway, thank you, Austin. Yeah, thank great. you. And, thank you, uh, Michael. Can't wait to uh, have everybody enjoy these beautiful photographs. So. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Thank you.
Michael, Michael told me before that like, when I was here a week ago, he told me not to get too philosophical, and I was like, sorry, it's too, did you know I was a philosophy major? I, I try not. I try not. I, sorry, I tried. I think, um, thank you. I need something to hold on to, otherwise I just completely panic. Yes, sir. The question I've got is that you were obviously printing yourself before. What was the kind of confrontation that went on in your own mind when you decided that you wanted Paul to print for you? Because yes. you're still working in film. And I, I still am working in film, and um, I don't want to get, like, too into the weeds about it. It's kind of a long roundabout process to make these. So I shoot film, um, and I'm happy to talk about that, why I shoot film. I mean, the short answer is that I, I like the old rituals, um, and I enjoy shooting film. And then I'm getting to that. <laughs> and then I, I scan it in to my computer, the negatives, and then I work on them and get them the way I want. And then I bring them to Paul, and then Paul makes inner negatives the size of the final print and mm -hmm. he could probably talk about the, the platinum palladium process more but as far as why um, yeah I worked in the darkroom for many years um, I always one reason one answer is that I'm always way ahead in my photographing than I am in my printing mm -hmm. way ahead I photograph constantly and so I have thousands and thousands of pictures and it's hard for me to stop and devote myself to printing. Like there's a part of me that thinks, I can do that later, you know, there's time for that later. But maybe as a photographer, I only have this certain window in my life that I'll be able to go out there. I always feel like it's just gonna run out. And, I, and so I feel almost this frantic need to just photograph and photograph and photograph. And so I just started photographing more than printing. Um, the, another answer to that question that's equally true is that when Paul first approached me about making some platinum prints, and I said, sure, you know, why not? This will be a fun experiment. And I gave him a digital file, and he met me and showed me his prints. And I just thought they were beautiful. And they were just alive in a way that I don't think I'd achieved. Um, and I thought, well, I could learn how to print palladium. I could devote myself for 10 years to try to learn how to print this way. Or we could just maybe work together. And, <laughs> I could get, it'd be the best of both the worlds, you know, I could just photograph and Paul was willing to take on this task of making these beautiful prints and uh, I couldn't be happier, um, to tell you the truth, yeah. I think that really answers it because Hopefully. The, the, uh, uh, the point of why, because those of us that have been working photographers for a long time it gets to that point where you become possessive about things. And, yeah. and I think you get yeah. over, you get away from a lot of it. And like I've said, uh, there are a lot of wonderful prints made of very dumb pictures and subjects. <laughs> and the thing is, is that you've taken, the question that, that you've answered for me is, is you've taken the best of your photography and have acknowledged that somebody else can carry it that step further in the prints. I hope so. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah that's what it is. And, I mean, and it was weird to see them for the first time because I was almost like I was looking at my own yeah. photographs for the first time. Like, wow, I've never looked at them like this before. And, and platinum prints just have a certain quality um, that's unique. They have a, a really long tonal scale and they have this sort of depth to them. And I thought they just sort of suited my pictures really well. And so I felt and still feel very fortunate that, um, that Paul and I became friends and we're working together. So. Teamwork, yeah. <laughs> yes? So, so to hitch right kind of that thought, now that you, you're working with Paul, does he collaborate at all on any of the digital post-production? Or do you do all of that and then hand um, it I spend a lot of time on Photoshop getting the prints to where I want them after I scan them into my computer. But yes, Paul will... Paul could talk about this. He has to tweak things sometimes yeah. to get them the way we want. The uh, truth is, though, that most of the work is already done when it comes to me. Yeah. So do you see it first as a digital file? or is I it do. Yeah. And then I, a lot of times I'll give Paul a guide print, and they don't totally match up because they're totally different processes. So I'll either give him, most of the time I'll give him a digital print that I've made, sometimes an original darkroom print. And it's been kind of fun to, like, you know, 
And it's, it's really hard to say, like, this is superior in every way. You know, there's always, like, sometimes this is better about this, this is better about this. But overall, um, I'll be the first to admit that Paul has surpassed my, my printing, for sure. So, yeah. Wow. Um, thanks. So. Yeah. <laughs> Kathleen, it's, hi. It's interesting to me that you, Thank you for coming. went to... Uh, and majored in philosophy, yeah. and then you say, I couldn't get a job as a philosopher. No. <laughs> it strikes me that you are working as a philosopher yes. <laughs> through your photography, and clearly from your writing, yeah. you know, that's how you think about your photography. Yeah. I, this is just the expression of your philosophy. I can't help it. It, it has made its, made its way in, although it hasn't translated to um, uh, financial security, but um, it's translated. It came, it's coming to my pictures for sure. Um, very fortunate for me, um, I married an engineer, my wife, uh, <laughs> and without her, I, I don't know, I'd, who knows where I'd be, where I'd be. <laughs> I wouldn't be here in these galleries. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm, I'm an open book, whatever you want to ask me. Well, I'm a photographer too, a filmmaker, and uh, I have this philosophy that uh, half of it, or maybe a lot of it, is being at the right place at the right time. And I'm wondering, do you spend a lot of time on location just waiting for the right time? Um, that's hard to answer. Sometimes I'll go back to the same place over and over and over again until I get it right. Or if I'm driving around, I'll, I'll sort of file something away. Oh, that corner, come back in the morning. Um, you know, that's the time for this. And then I photograph a lot. And so some of it's just serendipity. And um, you know, I make millions of pictures, and none of you will see 95% of them. So it's not like I have any like, you know, innate supernatural ability. I just spend a lot of time at it, and I'm very stubborn. And I've been at this for 20 years, photographing nonstop. Um, but still, even now, out of a roll of film, say a uh, medium format film, I have 12 pictures on that roll. Almost every single time, I have two or three. Almost every time. And that's it. That's just how it is. Um, that doesn't really, that's kind of a roundabout way to answer your question. Um, but some, some of it's luck, and some of it's going back to the same spots over and over and over again. Like the, there's the Point Reyes boat. Um, it's a big picture. It's the one that's on my book here. Um, this is on the way to Point Reyes National Seashore, and I probably photographed this boat 500 times, and uh, this was my favorite one. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, in every condition, you know, every condition possible, every kind of weather condition, every kind of light condition. So I'm stubborn, and I'm kind of fascinated to go to the same spots over and over again, and see how things have changed, um, and see them in different light. That really fascinates me. How you just cannot make the same picture twice, you know? It's that's very interesting to me. So. Well, a good example, so I spent a lot of time on the so awesome. here. Yeah. And if you just hang out for like three or four hours, Great. Uh, you can see the changes just by hanging For out sure, out yeah. I'm just wondering if that's what well, you're that, Yeah, and that's one of the things I love about photography and working with, with film and a view camera sometimes is that it really slows you down. And so it becomes this meditative event where you're just stop for once. You know, I spend a lot of time looking at screens like everybody else and on social media and just dizzy with it. But to go out and just stop and just be for a while and look and actually, it takes a while for your mind to settle, for that monkey mind to finally still, you know? And then, but once it stills, you feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm back in the world and I'd forgotten about how glorious it can be. Um, yeah, anyway. Ray, I think Ray had a question. Ray, Brother Ray, thank you for coming. Yeah, so uh, Ray's the one that wrote me into speaking at the Portland Art Museum some months ago. <laughs> and uh, that was one of the hardest experiences of my life. Uh, but I think it kind of led in a, in a weird way to this. So thank you, Ray. Uh, yeah. but, so if you're photographing all the time, and you've got all kinds of household responsibilities, I think, uh, do you do everything pretty close to home? Every, on a, for the most time, are you close to home? I, yeah, I don't sleep a lot anymore, <laughs> uh, at all. Um, yeah, I, I do close to home. I like to just um, drive, and I'll just randomly park the car in some neighborhood in Portland, and then just walk. And 
inevitably, it, it requires a certain faith that you'll come across something. But the thing that I found is that you always do. Mm -hmm. And you just have to walk long enough and stop your mind long enough, and then things will appear if you're in the right frame of mind. And that's one of the things I love the most about photography. So I do that. Um, but then on the other hand, there are places that I like to go. I like to go on road trips. And Gina, my wife, is um, understanding enough to, to know that I have to go out a couple of times a year for my sanity. So um, I've been going out to the Palouse in eastern Washington. Um, photographers especially will know that area. It's a beautiful area in eastern Washington. And I've gone there three years in a row in the worst dead of winter. That's when I like to go when no one's around. Um, and I'm hoping to turn that into my next book project, uh, Palouse in Winter. And there's something about that area that just speaks to me. And when I'm there, I'm like possessed. I photograph from morning to night and then collapse at the end of the day. And I think, what was that? Like, it just, it feels, it's almost a kind of scary feeling. Like, it's all just coming through me. I'm just scooping things up. Um, that's another roundabout way to answer that question, but a little bit of both, right, I'd say. Um, but I like to walk. I walk a lot, and it doesn't matter where, really. <laughs> yeah. I, liked it. I used to walk Astoria. I love this town. Um, and if you get a chance, I hope you'll be able to explore Astoria a little bit. It's a really neat, neat place to photograph and explore. I love just strolling the waterfront and watch the ships go by. Do you get out and photograph every day these days? Or? No, I don't. I wish I did. Um, uh, getting ready for the show, uh, probably the least I've photographed in 10 years, easily. And I feel a little, a little crazy not going out. Uh, that's OK. <laughs> I mean, it's a good trade off. But no, I usually now maybe a couple times a week. Okay. Um, so at least. But there was a time when I'd go out every day and just walk and walk and walk. And I think um, that's how I, I got better, I think, was, was thinking of it like, like practice, you know, like almost like a, like a sport. Not a sport is the wrong way to put it, but like that I'm training for something. Like you need to go train today. Just look and walk, go out there and walk and walk and walk. Um, so I, I, I try not to, I try to stay humble and I look at really great photographers and that keeps me humble. Um, on the other hand, uh, you don't want to be to beat yourself up and think like, oh, my stuff is terrible. So I try to, my, my mantra is like, you could be great, but you're not great yet. So, <laughs> you know, you always try to keep going forward in some way. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Austin, would you speak to your editing process, your initial editing process, and then also how you sequenced for the show? <laughs> um, my editing process, that's tough. Well, like I said, I usually, out of a roll of 12, I shoot a lot of medium format, so it's t usually 12 pictures if they're squares. About two or three is it. And I kind of keep myself to that. Um, so that helps me narrow it down. Um, and I just know them usually right away. Like they excite me in some way. If I'm excited about it, that's a picture. If I'm like, eh, eh, eh then it's not a picture. Um, and so I try, but once in a while I'll go back through my old negatives and I'll see something that I hadn't really thought of before and I'll see it in a new way. Um, so when I don't have anything new, I go back and I discover old things, which um, tends to make it look like I'm more productive than I am or traveling more than I am. People are like, wow, how did you get there? And they're like, no, I'm just, this is 10 years ago. You just don't know. Um, um, what was the other part of your question? Uh, the sequ yeah, I really love sequencing, and you know, my ideal place for a picture, for pictures, um, a lot of it is in a book. I think of my pictures ending up there because I love like having a, the idea of people being able to hold a lot of my pictures in their hand, and kind of enter into a whole world and go there. Sixty pictures or eighty pictures that really appeals to me, and a gallery show is kind of like that. So when I sequence, I, I tend to think of them that way to go, to kind of flow from one to the other, and that the pictures next to each other are next to each other for some reason. You know, like there's the elephant in its confined cage with the bars. Next to it, you have the police. You know, I mean, there's a reason for that. And then you have this dead end. This, you know, it's, 
there, it's, I'm kind of trying to riff, you know, one thing after another. Like, you know, like if you were listening to jazz or something, like it's related, you know? And I enjoy that. I love like putting my pictures together. And sometimes you see patterns that you never thought about. Like I had mentioned, you see pictures that like, whoa, those freakishly go together. And you see patterns of your own mind as well. Like, what is it about shipwrecks or, you know, that I'm so, you know, and I don't know if you learn something about yourself, but it's interesting to see these patterns develop. Um, we had a funny debate about this show that developed on Facebook where I, I set this poll out just for fun. And the idea was, okay, you walk into a gallery and there's a door in the center of the gallery. Do you turn left and view the prints clockwise? Or do you turn right and view the prints <laughs> counterclockwise? Or you just go straight for the wine, you know, or, or do you go, you know, straight for whatever catches your interest and then just zigzag around like a crazy person or, you know, and, and it was amazing, the responses, because for me, it was like, obviously pictures go left to right. Like, uh, how could you think they go any other way? Like, that's how we read, you know, that's how, that's how we read music or, or that's how you flip through a book. Like, if you have a wall with prints, for me, it's left to right. But then I realized that it's not like that at all for other people. It's just me being <laughs> crazy. So um, that was really interesting to me. And then people talked about horse racing, how it goes counterclockwise, and the rotation of planets is always counterclockwise. And I don't know. It, it, it was an interesting debate, I thought. But I was going to say, you, you can, uh, yes, you can look at this show however you want. I am not like a complete maniac about it. Um, go ahead and zigzag around. And I don't care. But um, Paul, yeah. Uh, there are refreshments downstairs. It's getting pretty warm in here. Um, <sighs> is it? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> so everybody, of course, Austin will be here for the rest of the night. Yeah, I'm in it for, for the long haul. So you can welcome to come up to me and talk to me about whatever. Um, thank you again uh, for coming. And let's grab some wine. And drink. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming.